So I think I should just very briefly introduce myself because some of the people I know who are coming here are not in the room right now, so I don't think I know anyone well in this room, so that's exciting. I'm really excited to be here because I always hear about how nice the KITP conferences are, so, and I've never been. So um, yeah, my group does, we do coarse grain modeling, so sometimes we do simulations, sometimes we do some kinds of uh, classical kinds of fancy functional theory or uh, self-consistent field theory. Today I'm going to talk about the simulation side. It's a little easier to get the grad students to kind of jump start in, in simulations versus theory. Um, and then we also kind of have two different areas, I would say. Um, a lot of our work has been in block copolymers and, and polymer electrolytes with ions. And then today I'm just going to talk about nanoparticle containing um, systems, which is kind of the other side. Um, yeah, so, so, and then at the very end, I'm going to talk a little bit, hopefully, if I have time, on um, liquid crystal containing uh, polymer systems. So I'm excited about that. It's a totally new direction, and I know, but I know there's some liquid crystal people here. So, um, yeah, okay, so back to what, um, what I'm talking about today. So polymer grafted nanoparticles. So when you talk about um, polymer systems with nanoparticles, Everybody always first thinks of, you know, bare nanoparticles added to polymers to make some kind of polymer composite where you're trying to adjust the polymer properties by adding nanoparticles. Um, and then when you think about polymer grafted nanoparticles, a lot of the context is people started grafting polymer onto nanoparticles so that they would incorporate better into a polymer matrix, right? So they're still using them in a matrix and then they may or may not aggregate in different, different forms. Here today I want to just talk about neat polymer grafted nanoparticles. So there's no free polymer in the system. So we inherently can't, you know, macroscopically phase separate because there's only one component. Um, but we can use some of what we understand from these other systems, you know, to, to build on. So one of the things that folks understand pretty well is if you put a, a if you take a nanoparticle and you graft um, polymer to it um, in solvent. So if you have a low graft density, then you know, you're in this kind of mushroom regime. You basically have similar to like your random walk that you would have, except it's now, you know, tethered to a nanoparticle. But as you obviously increase the grass density, they're going to start sterically interact, you know, having more steric interactions with each other. You're going to go through this um, transition from um, a relatively dilute kind of brush regime. And then um, because you have this curvature of the particle, if you have some relatively high graph density, you know, and, and relatively longer chains, then near the particle you'll get, you know, more of a brush regime, a concentrated brush regime where it's very sterically hindered. And then as it, you leave uh, or go further from the particle, you get more conf conformational freedom and you go to more of a dilute brush. So, so when you think about neat assemblies, um, you have the same kind of effect going on. So now we don't have any free um, solvent or free polymer, um, but they're kind of self-suspended or they're, um, these particles are, you know, suspended by the other particles. And so if you have a really high graph density, you're going to get, um, like we saw in the last talk uh, for some of those systems, you know, you're, it's just kind of like a soft sphere. But if you have a, a high graph density, I mean in short chains, it's, it's a little bit of a soft sphere. But if you get longer chains and a relatively low enough graph density, then what you'll get is these interstitial regions where you have really significant overlap um, and conformational freedom of the chains, and you could get entanglements. Um, and obviously, if you change how much polymers on your particle, you can change the spacing, you can change how well ordered these systems are. Um, so to get started on this project, and mostly what I'm going to talk about today, um, <clears throat> some people are using these just on a flat surface. So you can get really nice hexagonal arrays, um, hexagonally packed arrays if you just have one monolayer on the surface. Um, we're also interested in bulk systems, so I'm not going to talk about that today. So we basically use the simplest model you can think of as just Fini bonds, you know, finitely extensible bonds um, of a bead spring chain attached at random points on a, on a particle surface. So this is just a kind of a, a schematic where, you know, you can see all those blue beads are these graph points. Those are rigidly attached to the nanoparticle. And then I put, you know, regular Kramer-Gruss type of chains onto each graph, graph point. 
<clears throat> and then we do that at different graph densities. And we can do different chain lengths, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and then for these um, monolayer systems, we have also a wall. And we just put an attraction strength with the wall that makes it so that it basically makes a, a monolayer about the thickness of the inner particle spacing. So it's just supposed to be, <coughs> like it has to be a fairly attractive because we just have a vacuum above. So it kind of has to have, to make a stable monolayer, kind of have to have double, you know, the interaction that you would have with the, with the bulk to now make it favorable to also have a vacuum interface. You know, the vacuum plus the wall is kind of like the bulk, right? So, <coughs> so anyway, we just make a, a wall that's favorable enough to make a stable monolayer. And then um, we do different chain lengths in graph densities. Uh, all right, so here are some pictures. So we're putting 12 particles. These are um, coarse grain simulations, so they're fairly simple, but, but it still gets to be a little bit of a big system with these fairly big nano, spherical nanoparticles. So um, we just put 12 particles, and we put them in a box, it's a periodic box in 2D, and then the other dimension is where the, we have the wall and the vacuum. Um, so, so we have a, a monolayer, and it's um, the ratio of the box size is uh, allowing hexagonal packing. So we're basically putting them hexagonally. We're not really exploring whether or not they want to be hexagonal, except that you know if you go to really low graph density, then the particles will start to kind of pop out and not really form a nice hexagonal array, and then we throw those simulations out. So, so we're really just looking at simulations that form approximately hexagonal spacing. And, and it kind of gets better as you go up in graph density. So now we're exploring from 0.2 all the way to 0.6. And this is in, um, <coughs> in units of surf, um, graphs per surface area um, in units of the monomer diameter squared. So um, 0.6 is relatively high if you saw the pictures. This was, this was 0.6. So I think that's kind of approaching a pretty high experimental graph density. At some point, you can't really get much more surface to, to be able to graph on. Well, it depends on how much I'm willing to make these guys overlap. So it'd be, I guess there's some curvature. So it'd be um, less than hexagonal packing. But I didn't try any higher than, than 0.6. But it gets to be, we, I'm just placing them randomly, so it gets to be slow to find another random spot where, where it's free. But I could, yeah, I think you could get to 0.7. Um, but it depends on, it, are you allowing it to slightly overlap on the surface? Did you guys know it depends on the surface? We, today, and actually in all of this work, it's always uh, 10 monomer diameters across. So, yeah. I did some other sizes back when we were doing bulk uh, bear systems, but I haven't done other sizes for the graph. Yeah. All right, so, so these are them. These are the, basically how it looks like. And I also want to mention um, these images. I'm, I'm unwrapping them so that you can, like, so it's, it's periodic in 2D, right? And then... I'm making it so that the chains aren't broken by the boundary. And then also, I smooth them in time, because otherwise, you know, it just kind of looks like a big flat. It's hard to see what's connected to what. So, so these chain paths are actually averaged over time. So they're not quite, the polymers are not quite as smooth as that, right? All right, so, but I think it makes it more clear what's kind of going on. All right, so, so this is what the pair correlation function look like. So um, for anybody who is not, um, used to looking at pair correlation functions. We're talking about um, what's the density if you look from a nanoparticle to another nanoparticle, what's the probability of seeing another nanoparticle um, at this distance r away compared to the bulk density if it were randomly you know, distributed, right? So, so for the nanoparticle, nanoparticle pair correlation function, we're getting this peak corresponding to that first hexagonal you know, order. We can't really get that much further because we have a relatively small box. Um, this is a 3D G of R also, so, you know. Um, so, so anyway, we just looked at the first peak. And you can see that if you have the lower graph density, because you have rel relatively bare spots on your particle, then sometimes the two particles want to be near each other or find the surface. 
you know, where their bare spot is. And so, you know, you don't get as nice of order. And then as you go to higher and higher um, graph density, you're getting nicer order. But at some point, um, you know, it kind of levels out because you just have really nice spherical looking particles. Um, and then, of course, what's more interesting for us, and we want to think about the entanglements in these systems, and how would you be able to make a, an array of nanoparticles that's hexagonally packed, but that's also robust. So say you're making flexible electronics or something like that, and you want it to bend. Um, and so if you have, um, if you have really good interpenetration of the two kind of brushes on the two nearby particles, then you're going to get a more robust, presumably, matrix. So we want to look at that um, in terms of entanglements. But the first thing we looked at was the pair correlation function from the nanoparticle to the monomers, and we separated them out, the monomers that are attached and the monomers that are on the other nanoparticles. So the attached monomers are the solid lines, so going from a nanoparticle, and then you can see the kind of local packing at the surface, uh, the monomer scale order here, those little fluctuations. And then um, these dashed lines are the other types of nanoparticles, I mean monomers that are on other nanoparticles. So you can see basically where these two curves are overlapping is basically showing you where the two, you know, monomer, the polymer canopies are overlapping and where you're probably going to get more entanglements um, and more interactions that make your system more robust. Um, and, and it basically decreases um, <clears throat> with graph density because you're getting a more brush-like, you know, more concentrated brush-like regime where it's like, you know, there's less room for the two brushes to kind of interpenetrate and interact. All right, so the, the, the fun part of this is um, thinking about the entanglements and how what they have to do with, um, with the interpenetration of these chains. So we looked at the entanglements from two different ways. So when I talk about entanglements, I'm just talking about topologically, you know, when are the polymer chains kind of intertwined with each other that is causing kind of a long time scale um, <clears throat> constraint on their motion, you know, making them have to rotate around each other instead of kind of just flow past each other. So we can look at the, so if you start thinking about the instantaneous coordinates, you can just take those instantaneous coordinates and then you go to this primitive path method, um, just thinking about where the polymer chains are right now, and then um, there's a variety of algorithms. We use a very standard kind of Z1 algorithm, and what it does is you fix, first you fix the chain ends, and then you kind of iteratively, locally try to make the polymer path straighter. You know, if you have the path connecting all the little monomers, and then you try to iteratively, locally make it straighter um, throughout the system, but you can never cross the other paths. And so at the end of the day, what you'll get is straight lines until you get an entanglement where it's somehow constrained by another chain and then you get another straight line, right? So this, this kind of algorithm has been used for a while. We just use the standard one. And then these kinks in the chains now correspond to the entanglement. So just visually you can see how that looks like. And then what we can do from there is we get obviously the locations and who's entangled with whom, um, but then also we can kind of categorize those into, are they single kinks, like one chain already straightened out, but then another chain kind of kinked against it, versus are they these kind of double kinks where both chains are kind of collectively constraining each other um, in, you know, in this kind of way. And then, of course, within that, we can also talk about are they inter or intra to the different PGNs. Um, and then, so so that's that's kind of fun and standard, and then something that has been going on for a while, but is kind of less standard, is using um, mean pass, or there's some other dynamic-based ways to think about entanglements, um, where you can start with your instantaneous coordinates again, and then you can take a time average, which is super fun, because you actually literally can see, like, these smoothed paths start to form, you know, over time. Um, and so now it obviously depends on exactly your averaging time, and there's a lot more parameters you can play with. Um, <clears throat> But, but basically, when you have these smoothed paths, what happens is if there is, you know, they're kind of constrained by each other on some kind of time scale, some longer time scale, then those paths will actually basically lie on top of each other. So the two chains, 
similar to kind of the kink picture, the two chains that are entangled start to be right on top of each other. And so you can get now, by looking at the kind of close contacts between multiple chains, then you can basically get a metric for entanglements. You gotta now, everything is somewhere within, you know, some other chain. So now you have to define, you know, you have a lot more parameters to define what counts as entanglement and what doesn't, um, versus the, the primitive path method is kind of simpler. But, but it's fun because now you can get kind of a longevity and a strength out of this kind of data because you can see how close those paths were and for how long. So anyway, so those are the two types of um, analyses we did. So for some, mostly I'm just going to talk about this kind of primitive path kind of standard way. So this was what I showed you already. So this is the um, pair correlation function from the nanoparticle to the different uh, monomers on my own PGN versus other PGNs um, at the left. And then these are the kinks per chain that you get from the Z1 algorithm. So um, the total kinks, um, if you see in blue, it's going up with graph density. So there's, there's just more kinks overall, but they're actually forming within the same chain. So the chains are kind of straighter and they're, you know, kinky against each other maybe, but they're not, um, like they're somehow constraining each other's motion, but it's not probably going to contribute to mechanical robustness of the whole system if you like bend it, right? So I think what's more relevant are these inner particle, um, double kinks in black, and that's going down. Um, <clears throat> with graph density, so on a per chain basis. So this is what um, it looks like we can make these heat maps. Um, so just because they're black and white, some people think that they're sometimes TEMs. These are actually just heat maps. Um, so I probably should have picked more more fun colors. Um, but so this is a this is a top view, and this is a moderate graph density at the left, and then the um, twice as high graph density, the highest graph density, the system that we looked at. Um, and so you can see, as you get to really high graph density, those inner particle entanglements are basically just in the interstitial regions. And they're, ex you know, they can't really entangle where they have that concentrated brush regime near the nanoparticle. Um, and then, of course, as you go to lower and lower graph density, then you're starting to get entanglements kind of more around the whole system. Um, and then these are the side views where you can see um, even above and below those high graph density particles, it's hard to get an entanglement in there, whereas the lower graph density you could get, it's more uniform. Um, <clears throat> and then we can separate these out by the inter, it's a little more clear on my screen, but, but I think you can still see it. So you can look at the inter in the intra PGN um, entanglements, and so you can see, so now this is the very lowest graph density system that's not even quite as well ordered at the top and then the, the highest at the bottom. Um, and so a lot of the entanglements in the high graph density systems are just those entanglements between the same, you know, polymers on the same particle, which are really not as um, contributing to the overall mechanical behavior. And they're also really close to the surface. So, you know, the whole particle moves together anyway. So those probably aren't contributing a lot to the whole mechanical strength. So to, oh, I have one more slide on this. So then we also have been doing this mean path analysis, and it does look a little bit better on my screen, but it's, it's a lot more noisy um, when you try to do this mean path method. But we saw um, basically qualitatively similar results that look more qualitatively similar if you adjust the, the shading on the screen. But, um, <clears throat> One of the fun things we found was if you use this mean path method where you just kind of average the chains and you look at these where they're kind of near each other for longer and how close they are, um, you now have more kind of data to address how are the different entanglements, you know, how, how strong they are and how long they're held. And so, for instance, sometimes when we saw the same chains had two kinks between them in the Z1 analysis, that just looks like a really long held tight entanglement on the mean path analysis. So it kind of adds some richness to the data. Um, so anyway, then we did the mechanical properties. So what you can do is um, it's a little bit contrived, but we still keep it on a surface because we're still in the melt state and we just stretch it. We just deform it in, in one dimension and then allow the other one 
drink. So, um, you know, the surface, if you had a real surface there, its interaction with the polymer would probably be changing. This is just a literally smooth surface. It's not even atomistically smooth. It's just literally smooth. And so it just changes, you know, it has the same interaction. So it's more of a kind of a test, a, a toy kind of system here. So we're, we can um, pull on it this way or that way, right, compared to the hexagonal order. Um, and, and either way, what you see is the systems, and then we also compared this with um, homopolymer systems. So we made the homopolymer um, system about the same thickness as the monolayer. Um, and so you can see for the two, these are the, um, the stress-strain curves. So the, the toughness of the two nanoparticle containing system is a lot higher than the homopolymer. But also, um, the lower graph density system is a lot tougher because of those increased interparticle entanglements. Um, and then, so like I said, this was a little bit contrived. So what we actually wanted to do was um, cool it to below the glass transition. Now we have a thin film. Now we can remove the surface. It's kind of more fair to remove the surface. Now we have a thin film, and now we can, you know, do kind of crazing on that. So. So these are kind of fun. What we saw in the literature is, um, how much time do I have? OK. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do this fast, because I want to talk a little bit about the, the liquid crystals. But um, <clears throat> so, so there's funny boundary conditions. And I didn't make this up. Other people have been doing this. And if you think about a polymer craze, so um, if, you, if you've you know, seen polymers, and how they kind of have that, you're tearing it, and then there's these void formations where the bulk polymer looks about the same on either side. And then there's this region with these kind of tendrils and voids in it. And what's happening is as I keep um, pulling on it, this craze region is growing, and it's drawing from the bulk region, right? So actually, the volume is actually growing, because I'm increasing the amount of voids when I do that. So the bulk is kind of keeping its shape and then making it so that as I pull on it, it actually has a, the similar cross section. And it's just literally, volume is it literally increasing you know, in that real system. So what people do in simulations is you just set a constant cross section, and then you pull on it. And so you, when you do do that deformation, you are adding volume with a constant cross section. Once the voids start to form, then it's kind of fair. Because what it's doing is the, you're imagining the bulk would be kind of holding the space, and then the voids are, in fact, growing. So that's why the volume can increase. So if you haven't ever seen the crazing simulations before, it's kind of confusing. But, but it does represent kind of um, a real system. And, so, and there's also some fun experimental data that we could try to compare to where there are these little um, <clears throat> particles that Ned Thomas is able to um, uh, shoot tiny projectiles at these really thin films and get really cool pictures of how the crazes look. Um, so anyway, we just we cool the monolayers um, below the glass transition. So for homopolymers is what it looks like. Um, it just kind of breaks. So you see um, this is the side view and this is the, the top view. And um, it starts to neck down. And then you know these voids start to form, and then it just kind of breaks um, eventually. So it, it crazes briefly, and then and then breaks. Um, and where, what was that's a different um, chain length. So you can see the craze better here. I didn't sleep much last night, so <laughs> I tried to compensate with coffee. Um, but uh, my hands are shaking a little bit. All right, so anyway, so, so now if we do short chain systems and do the same thing, so we cool it below TG and we're doing this kind of crazing simulation, it's actually pretty brittle. It just kind of breaks apart. Um, so that's a fun test. But what's more interesting is when we have the nanoparticle, so now um, we're doing this crazing simulation with the nanoparticles with the entangled chains. And you can see, again, like we saw with those other tests, the ones with, which had the more 
um, interparticle entanglements per chain correspond to a tougher system. And, um, and it's much tougher than the homopolymer. So see, the homopolymer doesn't have this, um, this kind of strain hardening regime. Um, and what was fun was we were able to kind of qualitatively compare this with some experimental um, TEMs where you can again see their crazes when they have nanoparticles. And these are not matched in terms of chain length, particle size, nothing. It's just kind of qualitatively thinking about what's the main effect of the nanoparticles. Um, experimentally, they saw the craze was a lot more uniform. And, um, <clears throat> and also, obviously, their material is tougher, as you would expect. So I have to thank the people who did the work. And then I'm just going to show some pretty pictures of our new liquid crystal systems. And maybe we can talk about it later in the week. Um, <clears throat> so Jeff Ethier did a lot of these simulations that I showed today. And um, this, a lot of this has been in collaboration with Rich Vaya at the Air Force Research Lab. And I now just started a new um, AFOSR grant with Dan Hallinan. So we're excited about that. We're going to do gold particles with PO. Um, and then what I, we're, the fun thing that I'd love to just kind of talk offline about is we're now doing these fun systems where we put liquid crystal groups on polymer chains in different orientations. And um, there's some computational details as to how we can do that better. But the fun thing is, um, depending on how you put them, you can make layers of liquid crystal groups and polymers. If you put them end on, it's easier to make those layers. Whereas if you put them side on, it's easier to make this kind of honeycomb structure of um, where you get the, the polymer chains are kind of cordoning themselves off in, in a uh, cylindrical kind of way. And then they're decorated by these liquid crystal groups. And they correspond really well to some um, analogous experimental systems that we saw. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you very much. Questions? Hmm? So can you um, go back to the part where you show the, the separation? Um, so this? no, the, the, the early transparencies where you just put the two nanoparticle, the nanoparticle, nanoparticle correlation function, a little bit, one more, yeah. This? So yeah. here, for example, so, um, so so these so so what is the separation center to center of the gold here? Yeah, so it's it's here. So the, this is in units of monomer diameter, and so the average separation is right around the the peak here. The thirty-five. Yeah. So. So, but this is now so the part the nanoparticle radius is five, and then the monomer radius is 0.5. So around 5.5 .5 is when you see the first monomer. Okay. And this is shifted, right? This is already 5 here. So, so what is the, the other nanoparticle is at 35 there? And the other yeah. One? Okay. So, okay. So then, um, so when you do these simulations, do you change this separation? Do you adjust to really see where the, the optimal separation is? How, how do you do that? Yeah, so these were done, yeah, because it's not really fair for me to say, I, like, especially as I change graph density, right? So what we did was just do it at constant pressure in the in-plane direction. So we have, <clears throat> we, we have a barostat acting in the in-plane direction to try to keep the pressure about zero. And then we also have a vacuum this way. So the pressure should be about zero in all dimensions. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then, so it kind of slightly adjusts, but basically the, the parameter that I have to control how thick it is, is the, the interaction strength with the surface. So I set that so that it's going to want to be a monolayer. Because otherwise it would just want to be bulk, right? Oh, I see. Okay. But, um, but even with that constraint, you still, um, wait, is there any compressibility condition here? I mean, that, no, it'll be locally, like, you know, locally there'll be a little bit less density in the interstitial regions. And then, I, of course, near the top, if you look at a side view, and maybe I don't have a side view. 
you know, a chain can have like a little blip of a, you know, it can go a tiny bit into the vacuum. It doesn't really want to do that because I have uh, Leonard Jones interactions at a distance of, you know, cutoff distance of 2.5. So are there uh, voids in the structure? No, not, not large voids, but they're slightly smaller, you know, slightly less density in, in local regions and slightly more density in so others. So how long is the polymer, like how many monomers? Uh, the entangled ones are 160. No, the, the total length of the polymer. The, the graph chain is 160, and then... 160 uh, beads. Okay, okay. So, so it's a long a chain. So a Kramer graph polymer, the, the entanglement length would be like in the 70s. Yeah, but... but you didn't change the polymer length. It's always 160. I showed a couple that were brittle that were this really short length of 35, but those okay. aren't entangled. So most of what I showed was the 160. Okay. And then the homopolymers, we did a few wider range, but yeah. Thank you. No, I have a question. Uh, David Limmer from UC Berkeley. Uh, I wanted to ask about the crazes. Those seem very interesting. I was unaware of this phenomenology. Uh, yeah. I'm not an expert in crazy, but... <laughs> so, but very naively, I would presume that the morphology you get depends sensitively on the strain rate that you deform with. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it's probably quite hard to approach the rates that are done experimentally. Are there scaling theories that let you kind of span those time scales, or are you just trying are to make there? qualitative correlations? We probably could have done better than we did, but I don't think there's an obvious, like oh, this strain rate exactly means this. I think because you, at some point you start breaking the chains and I think there's kind of a lot of effects. Um, but, but we were kind of just having fun. So we picked some, you know, literature values and we just used those. Um, what was I going to say? The, um, <clears throat> yeah, we did allow, so I did say we had Feeney bonds here, but when we did the crazing, we, we switched to a cortic potential that allows for rare bond breaking. But, if you have a lot of bond breaking, I think you want to do a different model altogether. But what's fun is um, uh, Ned Thomas's lipid, I don't know if you've seen it, but they take lasers and they, they shoot them at these nanoparticles. The nanoparticle now is able to leave the surface and be a projectile that now impacts at this thin film. So, so they're able to make, they're really, because normally if you shoot a projectile at a thin film, the whole thing just breaks apart. Like, you know, but if you have these tiny nanoscopic projectiles, now you can get it where it doesn't like break apart the whole film and you can actually look at what happens. There, there's a picture. I think there was a picture. Yeah, it's really fun. So his strain rates can be absurd. So, um, so you can get to kind of ridiculous strain rates experimentally, but now that's like not controlled at all. It's just like there's some kind of strain rate changes over time and then the particle's gone. So. Yeah, thank you. So I was wondering how, how these results relate to uh, I mean the experimental observation that sometimes you get uh, crystalline super lattices and sometimes not. I mean, the, we were always using this picture that you, I think, mentioned. There is these mushrooms, and the mushrooms kind of make it difficult for packing. And so, But I mean, you have all these entanglement aspects. So is there a relation? I mean, can one get a better picture of why some combinations of core size ligand length and density lead to order and some others don't? I think it has to do a lot with the bare, whether or not you have space for bare spots, which probably also depends on how, if you're grafting to, grafting from, exactly how you're doing that, right? Because if, if the chains don't like each other when they're being grafted in some kind of solvent, maybe they're really uniformly grafted. Mm -hmm. Anyway, ours are literally random, like you just pick a random point. Um, so if you do get a bare spot that's big enough, which big enough depends on the chain length, then you'll get kind of local, they'll either kind of stick together locally, or those bare spots will want to come to the surface, depending on, now it depends also a lot on the interactions of the nanoparticle with the monomer, and then essentially the monomer-monomer will change how much the nanoparticle likes the vacuum or not. So now all the chemistry matters. Whereas if you have a really highly grafted system, then the chemistry of the nanoparticle stops mattering. So. I don't know if we can address the question, but those, those are the factors that are important. Uh, you would predict that yours with the dense shells that do not do the mushrooming would generally form, say, hexagonal or whatever, or triangular lattices? Or? So I'm never going to get like those beautiful, this kind of like really low, 
like they draw these these pictures, but like it's space filling. There's not going to be a void, so there, it's not going to be able to be like a perfect kind of mushroom that you would see in the when you think about Ono's work, where they're talking about insolvent, because there has to be. Even though it, we're not imposing incompressibility, but the the fact that we have attractive interactions is essentially imposing close to incompressibility locally. So it's never going to look like a mushroom, even if you get really low density. What it's going to do is the the particles will either find each other, or the you know the chains will find a way to be around each other. So it's never going to be like a mushroom, and but it can be closer to this semi-dilute polymer brush regime, where it's kind of interpenetrated with the the nearby. Chains. And there's not a great, I don't think there's a great theory for that, but I think it's also because it's not, there's no obvious way to write it down. Like it depends on whether you're going towards an interstitial spot or towards another particle. Mm. And so it's not like you can just write down a, some kind of 1D equation and solve it. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mike Dimitri from UMass. Um, have you looked at how uh, entanglements are either associated within a, the brush of a single particle or of other particles or triples of particles? I don't think you're going to get a lot of triples um, just at the kinds of par the parameter space we looked at, but we didn't specifically look for that. Yeah, but, uh, but even have you, but um, if you classify entanglements between pairs of particles rather than within a single particle, I guess that gives you an idea of... Yeah, how. that's what... I probably didn't say it that well. But, um, yeah, we separately looked at... This says double kinks, but act, it's actually inter-particle double kinks okay. only. So, yeah, I apologize for that. It should have been labeled. Um, because I think the inter-particle ones are the only ones that really matter in terms right. of the, the robustness. I mean, if you have long enough polymers, their self-entanglements, I think, are, are relevant. But at the end of the day, I think this kind of material is going to break on the lines of the, of, you know, the hexagonal ordering of these nanoparticles. And, and obviously what's holding it together is the entanglements across the particles. Chen Chen from YUC. So in your talk, uh, you made a comment that the polymer coating nanoparticle films can be bendable and could be useful for flexible, flexible electronics. So could you comment on what determines the flexibility? Is that the graphene density or external penetration or what other factors? So we, I think it's nothing stopping us, I guess, from doing some kind of bendy you know, simulation, um, I mean simulation of the bent, actual bending, except that it's, it's kind of complex and I think you'd need a bigger system size. And so we've really only done uniaxial deformation and then I'm just hoping that it has to, has to do with, I mean because when you have a bending, you know, you have tension on one side and compression on the other. Um, but so we're just kind of hoping that Basically, by we can address the overall toughness and it's somehow related to bending, but we haven't, you know, made that leap in a detailed way. Hi, Maya Landex uh, from Utrecht University. Uh, do you see any correlation between the number of entanglements and the mechanical properties? Yeah, so I would, this is actually one of our plans. So we had a a gap in funding of a year, and then now we just started up again. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I could see the entanglement number going down and then the robustness um, going down, the toughness going down. But in terms of, like, does can I, if you tell me the number of entanglements per, and, you know, per chain, then can I now predict the exact amount of toughness? That's something we need to do because we need a bigger span of more types of systems and see if we can really correlate it. And what I'd also like to do is correlate it locally. So is there something like where it breaks locally? Does it have to do with where the entanglements are? So something that's really fun about these systems is when you're trying to just, when you're trying to theoretically understand entanglements, you know, what is an entanglement? What counts as entanglement? It's a really fun system to do this because you have a system where the, the local regions of entanglements vary quite a lot, the local density of entanglements. 
which is not really as true in obviously homopolymers. So I think it's a fun test system for those kind of questions that we haven't fully gotten to. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So Asaf Whitmer Cooper from the University of Sydney. Um, I was just wondering how how does the number of entanglements you have depend on how you relax the system and how do you know that it's fully relaxed or how do you ensure Yeah, it? we look at um, the end to end um, autocorrelation times and make sure that you know at least so I have not simulated long enough for the whole particle to rotate, which is part of why I didn't want to show the really low graph density particles because now it really matters how much they're able to rotate around. So we didn't simulate long enough for the entire polymer graph and nanoparticle to fully tumble necessarily multiple times throughout the simulation. But what we simulated long enough was at least um, we, in there, we did a few different random initial states where with random graphs looks kind of similar. Um, and and we simulate long enough for the end-to-end -end autocorrelation time to decorrelate within the fact that it's kind of still pointing the same direction relative to the new particle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it, it does this during the simulation, it decorrelates, but it doesn't, the whole thing doesn't rotate. Right. But there, you got lots of entanglements, you'll have reptation, that could be much longer time scale, right? Well, I think if if I'm entangled, I mean, these are lightly entangled systems, right? Because they were 70, maybe 75 is the entanglement length. Now these are 160. But also, I don't have interparticle entanglements that are near the particle. So they're pretty lightly entangled. And then, you know, if I had an entanglement, I mean, technically the, it could move together. But I think if the nanoparticle is fixed and then the chain goes all the way around, I think the entanglements are are mostly relaxed, but yeah. but I think that the mean path analysis that we're now doing could actually better address that, and we could, I mean, we do see the mean paths come and go during the simulation, but I need a better analysis of that. Yeah, thank you. So, um, TiVo from John Hopkins. So since you're doing the simulation with a vacuum and a surface, yeah. I'm wondering if you look at the height variation in terms of the entanglement too, because basically you're confined at the bottom, but you're free at the top, right? So yeah. is there a variation in that as well? There is a little bit of a, and there's also a little bit of a density variation because um, the, the surface is attractive, right? So whereas it doesn't like the vacuum. So, so you can actually see it in this picture. You can see the slightly darker at the, the bottom is the surface. And does that then, have you looked at like the the, um, the modulus as a function of high well? Does that change the properties that you get back out? Because I imagine higher entanglement at the bottom is going to toughen it up and they're more there. But at the top, you're going to a lot more free, so your particles are more free to relax and stretch there, right? Yeah, I, th I think that's, well, for the, so for the crazing part, we remove the surface and then we, equilibrate briefly, but there's not that, because it's now below TG, so it's really not fully, you know, it does depend on the cooling rate. Um, but anyway, then that surface was removed. But for the melt ones, I do think it's going to matter a little bit, and we haven't separately looked at that. Yeah. Okay, we have maybe one brief question, or if there's none left, we are also already at 10.30, so there is now a coffee break. This will be if you exit here, you go to the left, just a few meters, there's a courtyard in the inside, and there will be some coffee there. We have half an hour for the break, so we'll be back here at 11 sharp.